Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. This is part of our East Coast studio here in Manhattan on the floor in partnership with the NYSC Wired community, the theCUBE community, and, and the Wired community connecting together. This is part of theCUBE's Silicon Valley, New York City, NYSC collaboration. We're going to share the network, share the content, and keep the content flowing that's open and free. I use Kumar's here, IBM, Associate Principal Data Scientist, and the, um, at the Chief Analytics Office at IBM. Uh, Ayush, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. All right. Very nice to be here. Yeah, so we love IBM, obviously a big part of our coverage. The 15 years of theCUBE, I think we've been to a lot of IBM events almost every year. Now they've got Think, but they're all doing a lot of things. I'll be in New York um, um, and for more IBM coverage. Awesome. Um, really love the Watson X story. Uh, yes. I love the unification across platforms. I mean, IBM now is horizontally uh, interfacing with a lot of different hyperscalers, multi-cloud, super cloud. Um, again, data's been a big part of the business uh, for years. Uh, what's new over there at IBM? Yeah, so um, I'm part of the chief analytics office. A lot of my role is infusing AI in the business critical workflows within IBM and transforming IBM as an enterprise with AI and unlocking a lot of productivity to it. And what we see is what's next and the platform itself yeah. is becoming more and more relevant. The way we uh, ingest a lot of insights for our business users has changed a lot. There is a lot of change in terms of generative AI, the capabilities that are within IBM and also apply to our external customers as well. So we're seeing a shift in terms of the insights that are driven in terms of the abilities of these agents, these assistants itself, and we see a, a huge change in the infrastructure and platform as yeah, well. Yeah, IBM's always have good traction. Let's get into some of the work you're doing as a practitioner, because you are, I mean, a practitioner at the same time as you know, looking at all the data. You know, as the young generation looks at this gen of AI, it's basically an application. Yes. It's categorically new. I, I, I agree with Jensen Wong at NVIDIA when he said, you know, gen of AI is a new category. I do think it's a new category because it's generating data. Not, it's not the same time every time. It's not, like a, it's not like a database query or a programmed web experience. It's generating stuff. So the data has to be there. And so this is really changing the data landscape. So if you're, if you're an entrepreneur or you're an executive and you're in transformation mode, you got to look at this opportunity and say, wow, this is huge. I get the user experience. I see the back end changes. We're seeing front end and back end innovation happening at the same time. That's never happened in my career. I've seen many ways of innovation. Both of those theaters require disruptive enablement, process change, tech stack adoption. This is not just an IT problem. This, this is, is process too. Yeah. So, okay, enter the data science world. Analytics has been around for a long time. Well, cloud's changing too. Platform engineering, DevSecOps is intersecting with that data analytics, and you're seeing a lot more um, new personas emerging, like data engineering. Yes. So, and then you get the models over the top feeding the developers. So, I mean, you got to like this new, new environment. What's yeah. Your I mean, that's all set. Sounds like a, a, a fiction story. <laughs> that, that's actually happening. Yeah, this is, this is really exciting times uh, to be in AI, for sure. You see a lot of development in different places that, as you mentioned, right? Like the data side, where we're looking at more data curation to feed into these models and LLMs as well. We have, as an industry, thought about a lot about structured data. We have kind of figured out how data lakes work, data warehouses work, how to enable enterprises with structured data. But when it comes to unstructured data, we are still trying to figure that out, nailing it down. Now we have more infrastructure uh, scalability kind of uh, issues as well, right? I getting into this. We have vector databases. We also know these models are trained on large corpuses, which means that we need these corpuses to be available. And some of the industry is way ahead in curation of this data that can be available to these models, but a lot of them are still figuring out that. And that would be the advantage that we have. Because with IBM, we have multi-cloud and multi-model, but we also have a data curation process and tooling around it to help with the journey of these clients. So as companies have to realize they have legacy infrastructure, you're seeing two scenarios, either platform incompatibility with the Gen AI or platform opportunity to put abstractions around data. Um, uh, I interviewed IBM at, at the Salesforce Dreamforce event, uh, and clearly that Salesforce has opportunities to go and unify all their fat, fragmented, uh, siloed acquisitions and products under one thing and they can extend out to the ecosystem to say IBM, Watson X, yes. to do some stuff because not everyone will run just Salesforce for everything. 
They'll have Salesforce and a zillion other things. So you're seeing companies like Salesforce do that. So every company's thinking about AI and saying, how do I leverage the foundation models, multimodal language and computer vision uh, to my advantage? Um, and by the way, language is only one step of the coin. Vision is a killer app of generative AI. Yes. There's more visual data than there is text data. So t take me through your thoughts on that. And definitely. So Salesforce is a huge partner of IBM. We use it on our sales cloud platform. We also use it for our CRM platform. And the way things are evolving is we, our platforms will get more and more intelligent and agentic behaviors will be included in the platforms itself. So if we talk about agentic behavior, one of the things that functionalities that we need from an agent is actually to invoke a platform or a tool itself. Now, companies are struggling with trying to build these connections first of all. And if the pl platforms really come out with these agentic plugins to integrate with Watson X and the other platforms within a company, now you have an enterprise which is well-rounded for enabling agentic behaviors as well. Because you don't want to be sitting there uh, and looking at Salesforce and saying, hey, I need something that can give me all the opportunity information and can create an opportunity that is a function that I need to define. It should be something that comes out of the platform within it. And something like Watson X can have and does have plugins to actually integrate with that. So you have an ecosystem now that builds on IBM platform, but also seamlessly connects with a lot of other external platforms that we are seeing in the market. What do you see a use for um, customers that have, that are going through transformation like this with Gen, Gen AI? Obviously analytics is, was pioneering the role of data. And again, IBM's had a good role in that, but that's we, that's well understood and certainly getting better. But this data engineering position's emerging. I'm, I call it that position because it's there. They're engineering data sets. Okay, so analytics always had kind of prep wrangling, all that kind of pipelining data. But you see at scale, more scalable data, because now new things are, are on the table, horizontally scalable data, which means low latency data, highly available, and high availability to either edge devices or other <laughs> mechanisms to get data. Yes. And then what's fresh? And then you got privilege. Privileges is the data unstructured, semi-structured, structured. Are there, is it, uh, have identity credentials around it? Privileges, which makes it more complicated. So there's a whole under the, the covers yes. opportunity. Yes. That so I think the uh, the effect that we have looking at generative AI, we, we need to think about like an AI strategy with a data strategy as well. And the AI strategy, we have kind of figured it out with traditional AI, but more so with generative AI as well. The data is where we'll see a difference between how companies compete with each other and as you said, right, like data engineering is a huge part of it because now feeding, for example, LLMs is a lot of unstructured data that has to be massaged and augmented to provide to the LLM to get specific information and usage out of it. We are seeing a lot of data generated from the LLMs itself. We are seeing prompt uh, data has to be stored and curated. We see within the process itself of generative AI that we need to tune our models with these prompts itself. Yeah. and guardrails are becoming more and more important. Like the input to these models have to be curated and protected, and the output from the models as well has to be curated and protected as well. So engineering is becoming more and more relevant in the data landscape here. So what's your big vision from a personal perspective? Take your IBM hat off, put your kind of a personal uh, expertise hat on. What? How do you see the future unfolding for data practitioners? Because you know, you, I don't want to say there's tension, but there's definitely more opportunities coming down the pike on how data is being managed. You see the, what happened with data warehouses, then you got now data lakes. Data lakes going to be intelligent. I'm sure, you know, AI will swim through those lakes and put vector embeds and understand all the graph data and understand all the in relationships around that data and do high, large scale computation on that data. So there's going to be more things coming beyond the data lake. I mean, clearly you can see connect the dots, like I see more intelligent reasoning, reinforced learning, causal AI is around the corner, which we're doing a big research note on right now. Um, right now it's just in probability. Yes. Gen AI. Yes. yes. Now it gets reasoning is, yeah, reasoning some probability. It's not really doing the causation and, you know. Right now it's not, it's not, we've seen how it yeah. reacts to, to reasoning and planning as well, which is like an important pillar within. Let's share your opinion. Yeah, so I think we will see um, a lot more of a data mesh on top of these platforms that we use. 
and the ability to actually integrate and talk to these agents and these platforms would be critical in terms of how we envision this. And coming back to the overall conversation around like, hey, we enable our sales uh, teams through more data and an augmented experience for them through agents. And this, this data is not just sales data that they're coming from. We're looking at like, hey, do we have excellent client information that we can use with this opportunity? Can we have more of visibility in what they are looking for? And that is augmented within these channels. So we are really looking at a more tightly integration, but I wouldn't say integration of platforms. It's more of an integration at the data mesh layer that actually contributes to the excellence of generative AI capabilities. Great to see you and thanks for coming in. I know we got this lunch to go to. Yes. Um, you're going to be attending the lunch here. Yes, I'm really excited for it. It's around AI governance, which is becoming more and more important in the generative AI space. Uh, prompt injection, uh, we all know the side effects of it. Yeah. And we have and to be don't ready. forget uh, context poisoning either. Yes. That's a yes. big part on the training side. Yes. You yes. know. Yes, context and learning yeah. is something which 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 used to be an advantage, but it, it can also be detrimental. To like, so what's, the, what's context poison? It's like getting to the kids early and <laughs> in infiltrating some bad malware and bad uh, malicious behavior. I mean, training training and inference. Obviously, the relationship training is super important, but inference is even more important because it's like school. I don't go back to school again, yes. but I can get, maybe take some classes and reinforce my learning and reason and infer off that tra education. Yes. This is kind of the same kind of paradigm. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, it kind is. Of? It is. I think it's it's like taking an extracurricular class now that I've been through school. And that's the way we've been training these LLM models as well uh, in terms of in-context learning or retrieval augmented generation. And really, like, training or fine-tuning of these models is becoming more and more expensive. But we'll see, I think, in the future, the cost of training actually reduce. We've seen, like, uh, effective techniques like pruning, quantization, that brings the size of these models really, really to an extent where we can train these models. These models are effective, but still we get most out of them. Yeah, huge analytic, data analytics um, area has been dominated by dashboards. We've seen all the benefits that's come from analytics. Again, you've been in part of that. IBM really has history there. But now the world's categorically changed as the new category emerges. The role of computer vision is an opportunity to get more analytics on. Traditionally, not a big area for dashboarding other than viewing something, but you know, um, visual data is becoming a huge part of the new inbound telemetry and or data sourcing that could actually get analytical information out of it. So this is a big part of it. What's your, what's your uh, view on this and how do you see this shaping? I think we, we are progressing to a future which is much more multimodal uh, than where we are today. We'll see more information coming out of uh, computer vision, OCRs that we do on our own enterprise data. Uh, we've seen that internally with reports being generated from our transactions, our contracts as well, going through the system to actually get more information out of it. And on the business intelligence side, I think there's an important change and shift on how insights are consumed. So traditionally, as you said, we have more reports, which are more visual. But at the same time, we'll have more agents and more pointed information and in-depth analysis that we'll get out of these systems as well. So multimodal is going to be yeah. surely the future. So definitely more insights coming out of that. Yes, yes. And you could you could have deeper yeah. insights now coming in. Looking at a dashboard, if you have a question about certain things, certain numbers, you have to talk to somebody, right? Like build something else. Now you have the capability to ask an agent a more detailed question around it and get that information much more quickly. I, thank you for coming in. I appreciate you. Yeah, and we'll fantastic. keep in touch. Great to have you in the network on the Cube. I'm John Furrier. You're watching the Cube and from our New York City NYSE New Cube East access point. We're going to access all the local network action here. New York's tech scene is booming. Um, all on the East Coast, a lot of surges. So Silicon Valley, New York City now connected with the Cube. I'm John Furrier, The Cube. Thanks for watching.